Okay, before I get to today's message, I want to pray first. Dear God, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to teach, to be able to share, you know, with my hearers, you know, the revelation that you have given me, you know, and just, you know, when I surrendered my life to you, I just wanted to, you know, give my entire heart to you. I wanted to get rid of anything that was not of you. And Lord, I just ask that I would be able to convey what you want me to, that's in my spirit, you know, to bring forth your truth, undefiled by the world's touch. So Lord, just give me the words to speak, give me clarity of thought, you know, between each sentence and between each word, and help me to bring forth your truth in this, you know, poor vessel, Lord. So I, I commit this time to you, Lord, and just bless it, Lord, in Jesus' name. So, like I had already mentioned in prayer, is that, you know, I had surrendered my life to God, and I, I really wanted to live for Him. You know, I, I wanted to live undefiled by, you know, the world's ways. I wanted to live a pure, you know, I hate to use the word religion, because Whenever I think of religion, I think of these other religions and, you know, something that's apart from relationship with our true God. But, you know, I just really wanted to have a pure relationship with Jesus, you know, not holding on to anything that was not necessary and that would hold me back, you know, whether it's mindsets, belief systems and hurts and pains, anything that would keep you from not only really loving, but really living for God. So, with that being said, you know, all these videos that I have made is for the purpose of you to be able to live likewise with God. You know, I want to show you stuff that, you know, is not right. You know, stuff that can hold you back. And so, that is what I really want to do with this video and, you know, the, the other ones that I had created as well, you know, is for you to get stronger in God, for you to, you know, what is something that is worldly, something that is religious, you know, and just to just get rid of it, you know, to have a pure relationship with Jesus. So with that being said, the, the subject of today's video is what, you know, I would say the title is The World's Concept of a Real Man. And I'm sure you've seen it yourself, whether in sitcoms and movies, and, you know, people stating what a real man is, and a real man provides, a, a real man takes pain, and, and in that, there is the possibility of, you know, people getting ridiculed for not, you know, fulfilling the shoes of what this world calls a real man. And, you know, you know, I'll get into it eventually, but, you know, I, I really want to show exactly what is the world's thinking and the thinking that is really holding people back. You know, I, I want to wade through the worldly garbage and to show something that is, you know, really true, you know, because are we living to the world's concepts or are we living to God's? You know, we are aliens in this world, but, you know, people have claimed citizenship in this world. They unpack their bags and they made this their home. And I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about Christians. And we Christians are supposed to be aliens in this world. This is not our home. We should live with our bags packed, you know, being ready to do what God wants to do. So, I'm going to get into this. Um, you know, I had already touched on it about, you know, different people's opinions of what a real man is. Real man provides. A real man, you know, takes pain. You know, he's macho. And so anybody that does not live according to the, the thinking of, you know, the world regarding a man, you know, will be ridiculed. And the purpose of the ridicule seems like to get somebody 
to change and to be macho. And, you know, so, you know, that's the world's, you know, thinking. So my question is, what is your idea of a real man? Do you base your opinions by the worldly standards or by God's? So let's take a look at what, you know, the world calls macho. Somebody that's a real man, somebody that, you know, people look up to. And, you know, the world's concept of a real man. I mean, he could be somebody that, you know, sleeps around with women and, you know, he, you know, just dresses cool or, you know, whatever it is, like, you know, the whole James Bond, you know, mentality. Gets all these girls, sleeps with them. And so he becomes, you know, the, you know, what people want to be like. Or you get somebody that's really macho, that can handle pain, somebody that's in the gym. And so they will, you know, lift weights, you know, to, you know, just to prove how tough they are. You know, and I recall one time, you know, when I was working out, you know, I, I recall this one guy that apparently was macho. And he saw me, you know, lifting. He said, come on, man, you can lift more than that. And I'm like thinking to myself, I don't lift what I can't carry. You know, I work up to what I need to. You know, if I'm, you know, bench pressing like 50 or 60 pounds, I'm not going to pick up 100 because that's more than what I can handle. You know, so, so somebody that makes statements like that, it gets you to think, well, maybe I'm not macho. Maybe I'm not you know, what I need to be. And basically, what are you living your life to? You're living to the approval of others or are you living to God's? So that's one example of, you know, somebody that's macho, somebody that, you know, all people are trying to live up to. And I recall another time when I was working at a paint line company, um, you had the option of being able to get out at three. You start at six in the morning and you get out at 3 p.m. And so the guys that worked, you know, some of them worked until like 5. And they more or less ridiculed anybody that got out at 3. And so that's another example. So that, you know, to, to show that you're a real man, you're going to work until 5 p.m. And more or less your whole day is blown by the time you get home. So I, I allowed myself to get trapped into that thinking, to the year of approval, you know, to stay till 5 p.m. And really, if anything, it didn't get me anywhere except to lose the majority of my day. So another area is, you know, the whole pain concept that, you know, a real man takes pain. You know, a real man can't cry. He's got to keep his feelings in. He doesn't share them with anybody. You know, a good example is, you know, basically... The Godfather, you know, part two, you know, bad movies, it's movies I got rid of, but I'm going to use it as an example. So, you know, Vito Corleone, you know, his wife was asking him what was wrong because he apparently lost his job. And so he didn't share anything with her. He kept it to himself. And so he, so basically that's another area of what a real man is in this world he won't share his feelings. But then you get hypocritical worldly thinking that, you know, the people of the world will tell you that you got to be strong, you got to be a real man and all that. So you get the world saying that you can't share your feelings. And then they come back at you with, well, you got to share your feelings because your marriage counts. So which way is it? You know, so you, there's conflicting ideas, you know, that the world throws at you. So you really don't know what is right and what is wrong. So the other area in with that is, you know, when you share your feelings, then the world also comes against you and ridicules you for doing that. And I, you know, I recall at a guy's meeting, you know, all of us got together, you know, to hang out and we would pray for each other and stuff. And, you know, guys would share, you know, their problems and what they were going through spiritually. And, and some of the guys that came weren't comfortable with it and they were ridicule, you know, that thinking. 
you know, that you can't share your feelings. And, you know, because that's not being a man, it's not showing any kind of macho-ness. So, those are some of the examples of the world. Now, let's get into the whole providing. Now, according to the world, a real man has a good-paying job. You know, he's living his life, you know, by the tips of those that are financially successful. And so, you have to have a good-paying job for the good of your family. And if you don't, if your wife shows any kind of worry, then you have failed your family and you should be ridiculed. And then you're labeled as not a real man for making your family worry. So that's basically stating more or less anybody that has lost their job, you know, to cutbacks or whatever it might be. And so if you listen to it, you're going to, you know, think that you have failed not only your family, but the world. So a real man will work so many hours, he will accumulate wealth, you know, so that his wife never has to worry, so his kids would have everything that they need. And so according to the world, that's a real man. But a real man is somebody that may have lost, you know, a real man isn't somebody who, you know, if they lost their job or they're struggling. And... So, like, a real man can't be in need of anything. If he is, then the world's going to, you know, call him a failure. And with that, there's a lot of men that won't share their information with anybody because they don't want to be ridiculed. They don't want to be criticized. So they keep it to themselves and they think, well, I need to take care of this myself so I won't ask anyone for help. And that includes God. And so, a, a real man can't lose his job. And if he loses his job, then he's going to get a lecture by the financially successful about what he's done wrong. So, my question is, when did this real man idea begin? You know, I, I haven't really had time to look historically, but it's my guess that it started, you know, when the breadwinner model started in the late 1800s. So we, we don't see this real man concept in scripture. You know, we didn't see anybody that was ridiculed for not being a real man. So we can base it then that it didn't happen then. So we look down through the years and when it basically started. And so, you know, it, it got into the place as when the breadwinner model started in the late 1800s. Both husband and wife, you know, worked together until the woman was forced out of factory positions and was forced into the domestic role to where they would be a homemaker. And so then the enemy wanted the brunt of the responsibilities to be solely on the man. And at that time, men had pride in what they did. They had pride in bringing home, quote unquote, the bacon. And so, it started as a model for all men. So, through the years, it has been added on to that, to where it's ideal for the man to have a sufficient amount in his bank account, for the man to have investments. If they live in an apartment, that's not good enough. you got to push them to go even further, to get a house for the good of his family. As if, you know, the... The, the good of his family that, you know, in order to take care of them, they need a big house and they need all that. And, you know, that's adding more onto the shoulders of a man and putting responsibilities even more. So it's more than just a man going to work, you know, bringing home food and taking care of any kind of bills. It's more than that. Being a real man means that you get what this world states that you have to get for the good of your family. So, you know, man now has the pride in providing. And if he doesn't, then he's afraid of the backlash of the world. Now, you know, this whole breadwinner model has set a mold for all men to live by. And, you know, this mold is for the purpose of every man to fit into. 
And if a man is lacking something, this world will come against them and say, well, you need to fix this. Okay, you don't have a good paying job. Well, you need to go back to school and get something better. Or, okay, you don't have money saved up. Well, you need to change that because you need, in case you lose your job, you have to have a backup plan. And so you have to have money set aside for budgeting. You know, what if car repairs come up and all that? So all this is designed to keep man's eyes not only on finances, but on, you know, financial success. Now, regarding of when this whole, ram, you know, real man concept began, was it an admiration in the qualities of a certain man? Maybe a certain man was tough in some areas. You get somebody like, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, the former president. You know, he went out hunted and stuff like that. So somebody could admire the qualities of the president and say, you know, I want to become just like him. Or you maybe you get some guys that have kids. And so they want their boys to be macho. So, you know, they I don't know, maybe they want their kids to be proud of him. So he'll be all macho and stuff, and, you know, if a boy wants a hug, he won't do that because he, he wants to show himself macho. I mean, that could be just a, a loose statement that I'm making, but it's, you know, just along the lines of that. So, you know, this is a rabbit trail, but with this whole real man concept, it has the potential of bringing rejection into a boy's life. Let's say a boy is, you know, very sensitive, you know, he, he wants a hug, because according to the redemptive gift of mercy, you know, that is the tender heart of God, that the, some qualities that men have, so they, they want to be hugged and stuff by their dad, I mean, that's assurance of love, so some guys that are macho will ridicule that and push their child away, their son away, and say, what, what are you, gay? And so the kid's going to think, well, maybe I am gay. Why am I trying to hug my dad? And so then they pursue that lifestyle. So the enemy possibly brings that ridicule in and that rejection. And so the, the, the boy starts to question his sexuality, you know, and move from women onto men. And so, you know, that's a guaranteed probably why a lot of men, you know, have changed into that. So... And it's basically a confusion, and that's the enemy wants to bring the confusion to men, making them think that they're other than what God had created them to be, you know. So, looking at it from not only a biblical point of view, you know, I want to try to set what I believe is right. Now, a real man is somebody that's a man by all by biologically God created them both male and female now we have examples of strong men in scripture we have Abraham we have David we have Moses Elijah and Jesus yet nothing in scripture brings the idea of what a real man is we don't see any of the clues of the worldly concept of a real man or anybody being ridiculed for not living up to those concepts. If it's not in Scripture, then we can gather that it is of the world. Now, if it is not in Scripture, it is a learned idea and opinion. And, you know, labeling somebody a real man or not, it doesn't speak life into their life. You know, it doesn't bring life into them. If anything, it degrades them. And like I already said, it ridicules those who don't live to its opinion. And, you know, that is something personally that I never want to put on to my son. You know, and I'm not saying, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of the, of the book Wild at Heart about, you know, a man. You know, a man longs for adventure and stuff like that. And, you know, I never want to bring any kind of feminine stuff of the world to my son and confuse him. You know, I want him to be able to go out into the mud and play. I want him to have a bat to play baseball. I want him to have fake guns, you know, to pretend. Because that's what boys do. Just like girls, you know, they like dolls and 
putting makeup on, well, it's totally different with a boy. I want my boy to have, you know, these boy qualities to be able to, you know, you know, differentiate himself by a girl, you know, but I also want to be able to instill in him love. I want to hug my son and if he accepts it, kiss him, you know, and if he accepts as he's older, that's fine. If he doesn't, that's fine. But I want him to have those qualities, you know, so I, I want to speak life into my son and I never want to bring ridicule to him. You know, I, I recall when I was like 11 or 12, my sister met this guy that she was visiting down in Florida with us and it was neighbors down the street and they were into hunting and stuff like that. And I guess this guy's older son liked my sister and so my sister didn't like him, but they were talking about going hunting and, you know, I expressed interest in it. And so the father of this guy was like more or less saying that I couldn't handle it, that they would have to leave me alone in a certain place for hours. And they were more or less trying to, you know, not convince me to do it. You know, they, they were trying to dissuade me for whatever reason, I don't know. But so it made me feel like, you know, I wasn't a man, you know, and you know, what's really important when, you know, reading John Eldridge's books, it's very important as fathers that we usher in our sons, you know, into manhood, you know, telling them you are a man, you know, and so when somebody said that to me, it made me feel like, you know, I wasn't a, you know, a man, even though I was a boy and here you have a father figure type that could speak life into you, that can call out the man in you. That was something my father didn't know and that, you know, he, I'm sure if he did know, he would have done it, but he didn't know nothing about that. And so here was this man's, you know, it was this man's opportunity to be able to speak forth, you know, a man in a boy and he, he missed that opportunity. He could have gave me that opportunity to go with them to hunt, you know, to bring out the man, to bring out, you know, what boys enjoy, what makes them come alive, you know, adventure and stuff like that. And so he never did that. So I believe it, it had affected me in that area. So moving on now, do you want to continue growing into the ways of, into the image of Jesus, or do you want to continue fitting into the world's image? And if you want to continue living by this whole real man concept, if you're a man, then really it's only going to hold you back from living the way God wants you to live. And you have to get your opinion from God about what a man is. You know, not somebody living up to the approval of what somebody's concept of it is, but to God's approval. Now, is this opinion helping you to love your fellow man or is it bringing division by saying you know to some men that you're not a man because you're not doing this and you're not doing that you know so you really need to think is it bringing life into somebody or is it bringing death and lastly if it's a belief system learned then it can be unlearned but the question is do you want to unlearn it so i'm going to end it here and I pray that this video has blessed you. Thank you for taking the time to watch. And uh, stay tuned because I'm going to be sending more your way. So, you know, when I finished that video, I felt like there was more than I needed to say. Like, to try to give it closure. And so, you know, we had already spoke about, you know, this world's concept of what a real man is. You know, them being macho. And then a real man providing... You know, and according to the world, you know, it's not just going to the job and getting what your family needs. You know, they've taken it steps further. And that means, you know, having financial success and to get even better for the good of your family. As if, you know, your family doesn't live by what they need, what they need even more, according to the world's opinion. So, 
you know, there's men out there that, you know, would call a real man somebody that lives their lives to, you know, what is they call success. And then I got into, you know, when, you know, the possibility of the origin of when it started, you know, the, the, the thinking. And then I showed different examples, you know, of what a man is, you know, and it's not based on the world's belief and concept of what they call a real man. And, you know, that being, you know, being macho, being able to take pain, uh, being able to have the, the desires of this world obtained by, you know, successful endeavors. And so I, I gave, you know, different examples, you know, of people in the scriptures, you know, like David. I mean, there may be strong qualities in David that a lot of people in the world can, you know, take out of, well, David killed a bunch of men. He's a real man. And, you know, they could degrade, you know, people around them stating, well, you need to be like David and, you know, be strong and, and stuff like that. And if anything, it really, you know, pushing somebody to be macho, according to the world, degrades them. And so if, somebody is not being led instruction wise by God, then they're going to be led by the world. And so I really want to steer people away from, you know, the world's concept because it doesn't bring life. And then we have, you know, and, you know, speaking about David there, you know, people would look at qualities of how he killed people and stuff. And he's strong in that aspect. But why not look at qualities that make a man, you know, godly? You know, David, you know, he didn't make the best choices, but he obeyed God. You know, he was a man after God's own heart. Why not look at qualities like that and admire, you know, just how he pursued God's heart? So let's not base, you know, qualities off by the world, but base them off about what God sees. If David was a man after God's own heart, then what made, you know, that admirable? What can we admire about that? What can we take from those scriptures in our own life to become more like Jesus? You know, not like David. I mean, you could take qualities that are strong from David, you know, because, you know, I believe God gives them, but it's not on the basis of degrading somebody and make them feel less than what they should be. You know, as scripts, you know, Christians, we need to uplift, you know, and not bring down. And so we have Abraham, you know, God, he was God's friend and he did what God wanted. He was always obedient. So let's take the strong qualities from Abraham about obedience and how he believed God and you know, it was credited to him as righteousness and that a nation would come from him. So looking at the qualities of obedience, let's take that. David had strength. He was a man after God's own heart. So let's take those qualities. And then we have Elijah and how he heard God and was instructed by God and did whatever God wanted. So we take qualities from him. So looking at Jesus, I mean, he was totally and completely obedient to the Father and what the Father wanted. And so we take that obedience, you know, that makes us strength, not according to the, that makes us strong, not according to the world's opinion, but by God's opinion. Because if anything, anybody that follows the world's concept, it is more or less rooted out of pride. You're in a gym lifting more than what you really should. It's a pride issue. So, and then Moses, he heard from God, he did what God wanted, he led the whole nation of Israel, you know, out of Egypt. So we take those qualities. So, you know, let's not base our Christian life following what a real man is, because that will get us off the path that God wants us. And that would make us prideful, you know, start competing with one another. 
So I, I really want you to take that from this video is that, you know, I asked the question, do you want to continue growing into the image of Jesus or fit into the world's image? And if you're following the world's concepts and, you know, wanting to take the opinion of other, other people, you're not walking in the image of Jesus, you're walking in the image of man. And that is not going to bring you any closer to God. If anything, it's going to take you away from him because then your focus is on the flesh. And let me uh, give a couple of, you know, more questions that I asked. I'm going to reiterate that because, you know, I had to add more to this video. Is having this opinion of the world helping you to love your fellow man or is it bringing division by that thinking? You know, if you're debasing somebody saying, you know, they don't have qualities of a real man according to the world, then you're lowering them. You're not lifting them up according to what Scripture says. It says in Scripture, don't think highly of yourself, but think of yourself with sober judgment. We don't look for the good of ourselves. We look for the good of others to build each other up. So you, you're not going to be able to build up your fellow man if you're more or less, you know, telling them what they're lacking according to the world standards, you know, why not bring the qualities, you know, call the qualities of God forward. You know, if they're, they're meek, pray strength over them. You know, if they're afraid, pray strength. You know, whatever it is that they need, don't debase them. You build them up. Because that's what God wants us to do. That's how the body works. You know, when one is weak, and it, the, 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 the strong around them build them. So that's how we need to be and how we need to work in the body of Christ. Now, if it is a belief system learned, then it can be unlearned. So if you've been living your entire life following the real man concepts, and you realize that it doesn't benefit anybody that's listening, then it's time to get rid of that. It's time to, you know, see the truth of what it really is. If it's of the world, then you need to get rid of the world. Because it says in 1 John 2, 15, Do not love the world or anything of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Because if you're following those world's concepts, then that means that you're loving the world. And the love of God is not evident in your heart when you're putting people down and ridiculing them and debasing them. So, my question in closing is, do you want to do that? Do you want to get rid of this world's thinking and live by God? Live by God what God wants you to. So maybe like me, you were in a gym and, you know, you're trying to lift weights and you get guys around you that are trying to lift more than what they can and trying to get you to do that. Well, all that's going to do is get you hurt. You know, it, it's going to, you know, hurt your heart because of what they're saying, because they're debasing you. They're more or less ridiculing you for, you know, not doing what they're doing. You know, maybe they're used to lifting more than what they need to, but that's not healthy for the body, as far as I know, you know, because all you're doing is straining yourself, and you can hurt yourself if you're lifting more than what you should. It's not good for the heart, you know, because you got to work into adjusting, as far as I know. So, next time you're in a gym and you see some guys do that, you know, don't even listen to them, and that's what I should have done. I mean, maybe I did do it when I was at the gym. I didn't listen to the guy. But, you know, that's what the world lives by, you know, this whole real man concept. So you don't have to live by that. You live by what God wants you to. You know, God wants you strong in him. And that means becoming like Jesus, taking the qualities of Christ and not the qualities of the world. So I know a lot of God of my guy friends, you know, and this is in closing that, you know, they had lived by this whole real man concept. And, you know, I really don't take it to heart because I, I just didn't feel like it was right. 
And so now that I look back on it, all the purpose of it is is just to ridicule anybody. You know, in you know, in the whole provision thing, you know, maybe there are some guys out there that are lazy and don't want to work. And so the world would say they're not real men. You know, let the world judge their own, you know. But if they are a Christian, you have to look at their situation closely. If they are a Christian, they're accountable to God. You know, they should be, and that should be their conviction. So you should never, you know, ridicule somebody and trash them for, you know, living according to the, the world's ways. And that, and I mean that by, you know, the whole fin financial success mentality. You know, you should praise somebody that's doing the best that they can. You know, they have a job and they're trying to go to every day, trying to, you know, bring home the bacon for their family. But, and, you know, a lot of the world will tend to say, well, they're not real men because they're not pursuing financial success. You know, they don't have a lot of money saved up in the bank and all these other things that really, you know, would make men feel like crap and to go out and get, thus taking their eyes off God and what God wants of them. So I'm going to end it here. Thanks for taking the time to watch.